So we have biodiversity out there in the world. We know that it's somewhere between 5 million species and maybe 50 million species, something like that. Nobody has a good idea. But the question is, how do we structure really good quality data to describe that biodiversity as efficiently as possible? And so there's some things I want to talk with you about uh, as far as what is really good information and what should it look like and what can you look for when you see a new initiative or a new idea and you need to decide is this worth my time or is this not worth my time okay so we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between real data and what I call smoke and mirrors okay so essentially illusions so we can call this field biodiversity informatics the applications of informatic informatics techniques to biodiversity information for improved capture management improvement analysis and interpretation that's this field that we're talking about of biodiversity informatics now John next is going to give you a detailed presentation of this idea Darwin core uh, there's some really interesting aspects of it. But essentially what, what Darwin Core comes down to is seeking an essential set of descriptors. If I want to communicate to you the essence of a biodiversity data record, the idea is that with this set of fields, I can communicate that essence, okay? it kind of distills down to just taxon, place, and time. Is that fair, John? Yeah, it kind of just tells us who, where, and when. So that's, that's really what we're talking about. Of course, there's a lot of detail behind those um, big generalities. So this is a very good paper to read. Uh, we'll put it on a USB key for you all. Uh, but this is, this is a documentation of uh, the Darwin core idea. But essentially, this is, this is a little bit old, um, but essentially, here's what I was just talking to you about with Darwin core summarizing the taxonomy, the place in space and time. And then you can see some links out to other types of data and you can see some links out to sharing data but essentially you can see the Darwin core as allowing us to link very different things like maybe genomics with uh, taxonomy okay by being this kind of nexus of descriptors of primary biodiversity data. I'm going to talk about what primary biodiversity data is now. A primary biodiversity datum places a particular individual or population of a taxon at a particular place at a particular time. So in some sense, it's related to the observation of an individual or a population at one point in space and time. And that's a really critical definition. The contrast is secondary biodiversity data. And this is information that has somehow been synthesized or processed or interpreted. Okay, usually secondary biodiversity data are based on primary biodiversity data. But there's a world of difference between these two um, types of data. Essentially, primary data offer information without any subjectivity, without assumptions, without interpretation, and perhaps most importantly, without information loss. Okay? Which is to say, it's 
perfectly well and good that if the Minister of the Environment of your country asks for a summary of distributions of endangered species in your country, it's perfectly, perfectly good to create secondary biodiversity data products. The Minister of the Environment doesn't want to see data, right? He or she wants to see information synthesized. And so you end up giving that person maps and hotspots and interpretations. And that does in some sense describe where the species is or the species are, but there's a lot of interpretation in there. If we're talking amongst scientists, like the people in this room, we want that unitary, fundamental, primary data. Okay? Because that doesn't depend on the assumptions and on the interpretation. Another set of qualities that's, that's very well connected to primary versus secondary is what I would call research grade data. Okay? So this is data that is suf of sufficient quality that you can base publishable, you know, cutting edge research on those data. Um, what you will find is that biodiversity information is often converted to secondary information. I'll call it dumbed down, right? There's a lot of information content in the label of, you know, each insect in the collection or each herbarium sheet. And in some sense, when initiatives aim to share information, sometimes they fall into the trap of simplifying, organizing, synthesizing, interpreting, summarizing. And that's all great for the policy makers, for the decision makers, for the general public. But scientists need research grade data. Okay? We don't need that interpretation. We want to do our own interpretations. So the idea, and this is essentially something I want you to think about when you look at the broader world of biodiversity informatics. Some of the things that you look at, if you think about it really hard, you're going to say, that's secondary information. That's not primary. Or you're going to say, that's not research grade data. Okay. So real improvements to biodiversity informatics in infrastructure will have these kinds of qualities. You know, this is not my usual style, you know, effective, efficient, novel, inspiring. But the idea is very, very important. Real improvements to our data world as scientists indeed need to be effective and efficient. They need to be founded on primary research grade data. They need to be sustainable and permanent. So one of the things we're going to be talking about a lot in this course is not just fixing up a data set so that you can do an analysis and publish your paper, but rather digitizing, preparing, improving and documenting a data set so that you and a million others into the future can use those data. So sustainable and permanent, reliable, publishable, remember we talked about that, but also these crazy things like novel and inspiring. Really good data will end up producing future science just because those data are so information rich. So that's, a, that's kind of a set of qualities that we should always be thinking about. So I want to give you two examples, okay? And I have the bad habit of speaking my mind. It gets me in trouble a lot. So here we go, okay? Here's National Science Foundation website. We have an award of almost a half million dollars. And the name of the project, Map of Life, an infrastructure for integrating 
global species distribution knowledge. Am I going to get myself in trouble, John? Of course. Okay. So that sounds great, right? Global species distribution knowledge, map of life. This sounds wonderful. So I go to their site and I took a very, very typically African uh, species. Of course, a bird because I'm an ornithologist. Um, this is Afropavo congensis. It's a species of pheasant that was discovered only in the middle 20th century. Its closest relatives are in Asia. It's a really cool bird. It's a, it's a peacock that's endemic to the Congo Basin. And look at this, I've got five data sources and I've got these different maps, a couple of different ones in green. I see some points in there. I see some less uh, smooth shapes. A lot of information there. But there's some really interesting things about it. First of all, you know, this shape. Why is it shaped that way? Does the Afropavo congensis occur literally in every one of those places within that shape? Probably not. Right? There are probably some clearings for farm fields. And I doubt this forest pheasant is out in those fields. There's some cities. I doubt the species is there. So somebody did some interpretation. Sometimes it's an expert who draws a line. I've been involved in those exercises. Sometimes it's a model, like maybe this came from an ecological niche model. Now these point data, those are somehow more fundamental, more primary. But why do we have point data only from the eastern side? So there's a lot that I don't understand about this. I could go back to the sources, but also remember, I want those research grade data, right? I want that primary data. And what am I seeing here but a lot of secondary data? There's a lot of interpretation that went into making those nice maps. My more fundamental question is, can I download any of this? And I still haven't found a button on this web page that allows me to download anything. So, remember my list of qualities of biodiversity data infrastructure improvements. Can I do research with these data? No. I can just look at them. Right? I pull it up on my web browser, I look at it, I feel richer, and I go away. But I can't do research. A lot of these data are secondary. So I don't want to do research with them. I want the primary data. So this project, for me at least, doesn't make the grade as far as being a real infrastructure improvement for biodiversity. Here's a different project. John knows a little bit about this project. Uh, this is VertNet. No, I'm not, uh, this, is, this is, you know, day and night sort of thing. Uh, VertNet is all about primary data, and there's no interpretation. It's just the data flow through the VertNet facility and out to the researcher. So this is this new portal that John has developed, John and others have developed. Um, you go straight to the data, so here's a, a record of, I, I picked another African bird, a record from Ivory Coast, you get the full locality, you can get um, all of the data very conveniently, you can get a map, and in some cases you can even link to um, media. Um, you can see your data geographically or textually. And perhaps most important is that all of the data are available. There's no filtering. There's no pre-processing. 
There's no dumbing down and nothing's held back. So just to kind of sum up these ideas, in biodiversity informatics initiatives, we really, really, really need primary data. No interpretation, no processing. We need research grade data. We need access to all of this. Access as far as getting the data into your realm of being able to work, onto your computer or onto your workstation. So we're really looking for genuine infra infrastructure improvements that make a difference to research and that aren't just what we call smoke and mirrors, illusions. Something that you can look at and then when your internet connection goes away, so do the, the data. So always, when you're looking at these initiatives, be it what our experts are going to show you, be it what I'm going to show you, uh, be it what you see when you go back to your country and you, you read some newsletter that announces a new initiative, you know, biodiversity of the world, or whatever, whatever the, the flavor of the day is, you need to ask whether that initiative makes your research world more effective, okay? So that's just kind of a commentary about why are we doing this. This is a, it's a, a complex new field. There's a lot of movement, but not all of the movement is forward movement, okay? And I, I hope you guys will take these ideas to heart. And so next time you read, again, the, the classic thing is the newsletter that says, new initiative. You know, I can just say things like, GBIF. Well, that's new as of 12, year, 12 years ago. The, the new flavor is IPBES. Some of you will have heard of IPBES. It's the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And you have to ask yourself, does this make my research world better? But if you, if you read you know, the different newsletters and websites and things like that, you're gonna see a lot of new initiatives. And just ask yourself, is it real? Is it primary? Is it research grade? And does it make a difference? Any questions? <laughs>